systems of units. In this, we're going to define the basic fundamental units, the standards, multiples of the standards in terms of prefixes, and how we can convert and make comparisons through dimensional analysis and the various units that we'll be working with. Okay, so and when we talk about systems of units, they are based upon fundamental quantities. Now, I'm not going to establish a unit for all seven fundamental quantities. We'll just use the first three, maybe volume. Uh, and I'll throw that one in there, too, because it is uh, frequently used a liter uh, versus the gallon. And so we'll keep that one available, too. So starting with what we call the fundamental uh, quantities, we have length. weight, and of course time. And in the English system, again, we have one foot as the standard, one pound as the standard, and one second as the standard of that. And if we put in volume, uh, one gallon will be our standard in that. In the metric system, as you well know, uh, one meter is typically the, it is not typical, but it is the standard. Uh, weight is a multiple of a base unit, but it is still appropriate for this system. It's kilogram, and of course, as we indicated earlier, second, and then we have one liter, like that. So establishing these as standards, the main concern is to have ways of doing comparisons, scaling these up and scaling them down. Now, the way that's done is using prefixes, and defining multiples or fractions of standards. So prefixes for defining Now, the way I illustrate this is kind of unique, and if you would, make a vertical line as shown here. Hopefully, yours is straighter than mine, more vertical. And in the middle, what we'll do is put the standards right there. Uh, length. Uh, and, and we'll do this in terms of uh, the metric system, since we're using the metric system for the most part. Length is the meter. Weight is the kilogram. I'm going to change that. I'm sorry. I should put gram because it's, while it's not the unit, uh, standard unit, we have to start with a base unit. And the second. Now, in order to talk about larger multiples, we use prefixes uh, and multiples of 10 times 10, hundreds, and then thousands, and millions. And 
hundreds or thousands, millions, ten to the six, billion, ten to the ninth, and if we go higher, ter ten to the twelfth is a tera. You've heard of terabyte drive, uh, hard drives, and so forth. What the uh, multiples will do is give you blocks of the uh, base units. Uh, when we talk about 10 meters, we would talk about it in terms of decameters. If we talk about 100 meter quantities, it's hecto. If we talk about a 1,000 meter group, it's kilo. Now, when you get up to the uh, millions, it's mega, and billions, it's giga. And then if you went to 10, again, 10 to the 12th, it would be tera. So, you, so we're talking about a uh, standard hard drive that has one terabyte storage and you want to uh, 10 to the 12 bits storage. It's quite a bit. Now, that would also apply to the gram. Here we have decagram, which would be 10 grams. Uh, hectogram, which would be 100 grams. Kilogram would be, of course, uh, 1,000 grams, which is the standard. And a million grams, megagram, giga, a billion tera, uh, 10 to the 12. And so that's basically how... Disregarding the loud noises you hear on this thing, we won't be tested on that. Okay, so we talk about the multiples uh, up here. Now, I typically uh, put a capital letter on the multiples greater than uh, one. That's not a standard operating procedure, but it does define a uh, value greater than. Uh, those fractions of the standard, I use lowercase to introduce the fraction. Uh, and usually these are uh, one-tenth of the standard, one one-hundredth, and so forth. One one-thousandth, a millionth, and a billionth. And we'll stop there. That's typically small enough. <coughs> Deci indicates one tenth. Centi represents a hundred. Uh, milli, a thousandth. Micro, one millionth. And nano, one billion. So we can talk about nanometer. light wavelengths, that is, are identified in terms of uh, nanometers and nanograms, ex you know, extremely small quantities, nanoseconds, you can imagine even smaller and smaller quantities. <clears throat> now, that brings us to what we call the dimensional analysis. Now, this is taking a specific uh, measurement and converting it into terms of either the English or metric or larger metric or smaller metric using what is known as conversion factors and so forth like that. And of course the concept is dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis can be used in many ways to solve chemistry problems, the, uh, solving anything from measurement conversions to chemical equations, 
uh, analysis and so forth. I use a little bit different method on my chemical equation analysis. I like ratio and proportion and uh, relationships like that. But for measurements, I at, for academic reasons, I divide this instruction. There are actually no books that define it like I'm about to do it. Uh, into three categories, what we call the simple conversions, This is single unit to single unit conversion, grams to pounds or seconds to years and this kind of thing. Uh, the second category is what we call multiple conversions. And this only has two uh, types of conversions in it, squares and cubes. And then we have the complex conversions. These are complex units being converted to other complex units. A complex unit is a combination of fundamental units. For example, length is a unit with a uh, time unit. You can't convert uh, the true units of time seconds into a unit of length in the, in the context of uh, meters, feet, and so forth like that. So I developed some examples around each one of these because there are specific little techniques you have to apply for each category. Let's start with the simple conversions and work a couple of problems in that. Uh, how many millimeters equal, I don't know, 35 miles? method evolved, and here's the question, and here's your data, collect your information, and then you want to go through the hypothetical hypothesis of leading to the answer. That involves a series of ratios that eliminate units in order. A unit, for example, miles, if I wanted to eliminate that, I would have to have something in a denominator function like that so that the miles and miles would cancel out. And I do not know what the relationship between miles and millimeters is directly, but I know some other smaller relationships as we go through these that I can build on that will lead me to the desired uh, dimension. Uh, we'll use feet. We'll use statue miles of 5,280 feet in one mile. So that's a common known. Now, one of the things that I do for you on, a, on test day is attach a reference sheet. I do not ask students to memorize reams of conversion factors. I know some conversion factors simply because I've used them over the years. And you, it's just something you would look up anyway. It's knowing how to apply the conversion factors that, is, that to me is of greatest concern. So you will have these factors available to you. So I do not know what the relationship between feet, I need to get rid of feet, and I don't have a millimeter relationship, but I do have inches that I know and there are 12 inches in one foot. I always associate the number with the proper dimension. Okay, 12 goes with, of course, the inches, and one goes with the 
foot. So as we go through this process, you can see how we cancel out the units as we go. And from inches, I can get into the metric system because I know that for one inch, um, I can. There are 2.54 centimeters for every one inch, like that. <clears throat> now, of course, uh, inches are now into centimeters, and of course, getting to millimeters is just there are 10 uh, millimeters per one centimeters, and so we have arrived at the desired dimension. So 35 miles down here just in passing is also over one. So all of the denominators across are ones. So we can jump over that and just multiply the numerators in the following way, 35, 5,280, 12, 2.54, 10, bracket that, and apply the unit that we need. Okay, now one of the rules on significant figures is you round the number to the least number of significant figures in the measurement. Okay, in this problem, the only measurement we have is 35 miles. Okay, you do not round your uh, results or your calculation relative to the digits that are in the conversion factor or constants, round relative to the measurements in this. Now, the calculator answer in this is 5.63207.04 times 10 to the 7th millimeters, but I only need two significant figures in the final answer, so I would round this to 5.6, 3 does not make 6 any larger, uh, times 10 to the 7th millimeters, and that is a simple conversion. Now, simple conversions most of you are familiar with and will be using extensively in uh, throughout the course. So there are some worksheets if you struggle with dimensional analysis that convert a number of units, single units, single units, so please invest your time in that as needed. Uh, <clears throat> the multiple conversions are squares to uh, squares, like square feet to square centimeters, or cubic meters, something of this nature, uh, to cubic millimeters or something like that. The reason is, the way I teach this is it's a simple conversion. So you apply a simple conversion unit to unit, and at the end of that, when you get it set up, you square all of the conversion factors, not the measurement, just the conversion factors. Or if it's cubed, you simply cube the conversion factor. Okay, I should give you an example. Uh, how many feet 
square feet, let's do mm -hmm. square, square feet equals 2,350 uh, square centimeters. Right there. So we want to convert square centimeters to square feet. Now, the idea is, again, to use simple conversion first and then square the conversion factors. Do not re-square the measurement. This is your measurement portion. So this already is squared from whatever measurement you made. So I need to get this to feet. So I want to go get rid of centimeters and go to feet. Well, I know there's a relationship inches and feet times inches, I mean inches and centimeters, and then inches to feet, like that. So uh, for each inch, there are 2.54 centimeters and 12 inches in each foot. Now the step next is to square each conversion factor. So this is distributed through the parentheses, so I'd have square inches and square centimeters. So the square centimeters would drop out, and then I'd square inches would drop out, and so I'm left with square feet at the end of the uh, calculation. Now, the conversion factors have to be squared. One to one's, of course, squared. But I've put this in here for academic reasons to see that I've taken the two and squared it, or the squared squared, one over the squared. And so the computation is in square feet when everything's said and done. So this is I'm laying this out in terms of calculator answers, and you can see that. So we study the issue. Now, the trailing zeros are not significant figures, so this only has three significant figures in it. So we would round the final answer to three significant figures, whatever they may be. So we have. Um, Point five two nine five one eight nine four eight square feet. Of course, that's a ridiculous answer. We only want to retain uh, three significant figures. Well, nine is greater than five. Five or greater. Well, the last retained digit you increase by one. So our final answer here would be appropriately. 2.53 square feet and the 2,350 uh, square inches. But the significance of this is not so much all the multiplication and division and stuff, is that you understand that it starts with a simple conversion and carries to the de desired dimension. And then you go back and isolate the conversion factor and square it. And you can do the same thing with cubes. You can change this to cubic feet and cubic centimeters. And the procedure is the same. You just cube the uh, values inside the parentheses. Uh, so I usually don't do a cube. I think you change one to cube just about as easy as I can. Uh, complex conversions. is the conversion of mixed fundamental units to mixed fundamental units or fundamental quantities. For example, uh, how many pounds per square inch equals 
813, I'm just making it up, uh, grams per uh, square centimeter, like that. Well, the issue, the procedure is convert one unit at a time. When you finish that one, then you go back and convert the other. And this one, we'll do the grams first. That's a uh, simple conversion in itself. So grams essentially is a numerator number. So I need to get grams to pounds. I know that there are 454 grams in one pound. So that takes care of the grams and gets me to the desired unit of pounds. Now, I need to go from centimeters, the square centimeters to square inches, but I'll start with the uh, centimeters and make that, set up that conversion, and then go back and square the uh, conversion factors. So centimeters will go on top, inches on the bottom, and I know there's 2.54 centimeters in each inch, like that. And again, this is a multiple conversion squared, as shown here. So now the um, centimeters have been canceled, and so the remaining units are pounds per square inch, which, of course, is the desired dimension. And so in this case, uh, we have... One three times two point five four squared over four hundred and fifty four pounds per square inch. If that happens to be the problem you're working, okay, then Enough pounds per square inch, right there. Now the measurement only has three significant figures in it. All, di all non-zero digits are significant in a measurement, so we would round it to those dimensions. Five would cause the retained five to move to six and the expressed answer would be 11.6 pounds per square inch. Okay, so those are the three types of conversions you will be responsible for, and of course those are the only types of conversions we have to deal with in terms of uh, measurements like this. Of course, it can be used to make conversions uh, in uh, chemical reactions. Some of you used those before. We'll deal with those when we certainly get to them, okay? Now, one type of conversion is that of percentage. And this is sometimes a misunderstand, understood, excuse me, understood topic. Percentage, parts per million and parts per billion will all be about uh, defined in terms of the same concepts, percent units or percent will be parts per hundred. Parts per million, you've seen that some occasionally. And parts per billion, PPB, is the abbreviation. Like that. By definition, percent is part over total 
times 100 percent. Now, the part over total, whether it's associated with percent or whether it's associated with parts per million or whether it's associated with parts per billion, is a decimal fraction. So this ratio is always a decimal fraction. convert to parts per hundred, you multiply by 100. Well, it just turns out that parts per hundred is also percentage. To convert to parts per million, all you do is multiply times a million, the decimal fraction times a million. Or to convert to parts per billion, once you get your fraction ratio, you multiply times um, a billion. 10 to the ninth. So if you're given a problem, uh, a weight-weight ratio problem, um, a salt solution weighing 285 grams, simple salt solution, weighing 285 grams contains 38 grams of salt. Express concentration and Percent parts per hundred, parts per million, and parts per billion. So out of a ratio part over total, you can get all of these just by the multiple that you use. So your concentration in terms of the fraction is 38 grams, which is the part, over 285 grams, the total, which would be, of course, the 35 grams plus whatever solvent you have in there. It's the mixture. So you have 38 grams divided by 285 grams. Now, if you multiply that by 100, you get one of two things, which are identical, which are the same. You get a percent number, or you get parts per hundred, like that. They're both the same. It's just for whatever reason, people define parts per hundred as percentage, like that. Or if I wanted this in parts per million, times 10 to the 6, and this would be parts per million. But fundamentally, it is a um, still from a decimal fraction times whatever factor you want. Parts per billion would be 38 over 285, of course that's grams and grams, times 10 to the 9th PPB. So you can express it how you wish, depending on the application you're working with. And in terms of percentage, it's just times 100. Parts per hundred, percentage, the same thing. Billion times 10 to the ninth, million times 10 to the sixth. Okay, the next issue is, say you're given a percentage. The next issue is converting uh, percentage values, percentage concentrations uh, to parts per million or a percent concentration and to parts per billion. Okay, now from the literature, from reference lit, 
literature, uh, percent argon in the atmosphere equals 0 0.90. Percent by weight. Okay. Now, what does? How do we convert this to parts per million or parts per billion? Well, pretty straightforward. First thing you have to understand is what um, does 0 0.90 percent mean? Well, in essence, it is 0 0.90 parts per 100 parts of a mix argon per 100 parts of a mix so that's essentially what a percentage uh, is tells you what it is so if you want to convert this to parts per million all you need to do is 0 0.90 over 100 times 10 to the 6 and that would immediately take it to parts per million or if you need it in parts per billion it would be 0 0.90 over 100 which is the percent factor right here and 10 to the ninth parts per billion so that's 9,000 parts per million or nine zero 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 parts per billion. Which is probably more appropriate to be nine times ten to the six parts per uh, billion which is nine times ten to the third parts per million temperature conversions to most of you. Uh, the temperature scales that we'll be, of course, working with are Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit, uh, degrees Celsius, and Kelvin. It is important that you are able to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius and Celsius to Kelvin, Kelvin back to Celsius, and Celsius back to Fahrenheit. It's not necessary to learn how to do Fahrenheit to Kelvin because typically the problems are given in Celsius and you'll work between Ke Celsius and Kelvin. So if you are given Fahrenheit and you need to determine degrees Celsius, the formula degrees Celsius is equal to 5 ninths degrees Fahrenheit uh, minus 32. Now, that has a parenthesis in it. Look at Celsius. Celsius is typically a smaller number inherently than the Fahrenheit number. So that's 5 ninths is smaller. And C looks like a parenthesis. Because if you're given degrees C and you need uh, Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit is inherently a larger number relationship to so it would be 9 fifth degrees C plus 32. This second formula does not have a parenthesis in it. C looks like parentheses over here. So that kind of is a memory device you can use to remember the formula. Fahrenheit does not have that. Now, you'll only work between Celsius and Kelvin or Kelvin back to Celsius. And typically, you're given degrees Celsius and calculate Kelvin, OK? So Kelvin is equal to degree C plus 273 degrees.
Now, if you've never seen where these come from, they come from the point slope method of analysis in terms of, well, the Fahrenheit Celsius conversions. It look like this. Make this axis degrees C and this axis degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we know what the boiling point, freezing points of water are, uh, and so that's the way we will uh, set two points. Uh, freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius, and Fahrenheit being on the y-axis is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And the boiling point of water is 100 degrees C and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Using the point slope method of analysis, have is a y minus y1 equals change in y over change in x uh, times x minus x1, and we'll use that R2. You can derive the same formulas, y minus y2, delta y over delta x, x minus x2 is the same thing. But I like to use y minus y1 and x minus x1 because x1 is 0. I can drop it out, and so the whole derivation is simpler. Well, y here is degrees Fahrenheit. So we need degrees Fahrenheit number one, which is in here. Okay, so that equals uh, change in y over no, the, the change in y, which would be 212 minus uh, 32. Uh, will be your change in your Fahrenheit, change in degrees Fahrenheit, that's what I want to get, and over change in de degrees C, and then you have degrees C minus degrees C1. So you have that relationship that you want to substitute using the two points that you have. So the two points are applied to that expression. So we have degrees Fahrenheit minus 32. Okay, we'll use that one right there is equal to the change in y, which is 212 minus 32 divided by uh, 100 minus 0, and then degrees C minus 0 there. And so this expression simplifies to degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 to equal 180 over 100, or is it, I always miss that, right. there, okay, degrees C, and I can drop out the zero right here, and that's nine out of five degrees C, and so from here, I can solve for Fahrenheit to equal 9 fifths degrees C uh, plus 32, or I can solve for the uh, degrees C right here, divide both sides by 9 fifths, and, but I'd have to put this one in this term in parentheses, and I'd get degrees C to equal 5 over 9 as it inverts and multiplies and it'd be degrees Fahrenheit minus 32. So you see how the point slope is, can't get it all on there. Point slope method is used to derive those two expressions. Okay. And when we get to thermodynamics, we will deal with the absolute temperature scale. That is the third law of thermodynamics, and I'll develop that at the time. But right now, the only thing you need is degrees well, Kelvin, notice Kelvin doesn't have a degree mark on it either. So 
Kelvin is equal to degrees C plus 273, or degrees C is equal to Kelvin minus 273. Test A will ask you for one or the other. Give you Kelvin, you calculate C, or given C, calculate Kelvin. I do have those. The next topic is energy conversions. Now, to understand the uh, concept of energy conversions, we need to start with uh, asking ourselves, what is energy? Uh, from the physics textbook, energy is defined as the capacity to do work. Also, if we take work from the definition in the physics book, it is a force acting through a distance or force times distance. Well, Newton's second law, we can substitute the definition of Newton's second law into the uh, force term, and that's mass times acceleration and then we continue with the distance. From the standard international units, we can substitute the units for mass is of course kilograms, and acceleration is a change in velocity over change in time, which uh, turns to be um, meters over seconds squared, change in velocity, meters per second, divided by seconds, and then an inverse seconds, and get seconds squared, times another distance, meters. So it ultimately comes down to kilogram meters squared over second squared, a complex unit which, to simplify, is to be redefined as units for the joule. Okay? Now, that's one of two uh, energy units that we need to take into account. The uh, second energy unit is uh, the scientific calorie. which is a lowercase c, not to be confused with the nutritional calorie. The nutritional calorie is 1,000 uh, scientific calories. And in this course, from this point on, uh, anytime we'll refer to uh, calories in a general context, uh, we'll be talking about scientific calorie. Uh, if we need to discuss the nutritional calorie, uh, I'll tell you that we are working with the nutritional calorie, which is a uh, kilocalorie at any, any rate. Uh, now, uh, from a pure measurement standards point of view, uh, the definition of a calorie, little c, like that is simply the amount of heat energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram 
of pure water by 1.000 degree Celsius. Now, it has been shown that the relationship between the calorie and the joule is given as follows. Uh, 1.000 calorie is equal to 4.184 uh, joules. Now, so there's your fundamental conversion factor. Now, in chemistry, we find the need to work with energy factors uh, in many places. One, of course, is with the chemical equation. And in time, we will find how the uh, chemical equation has attached to it an energy number known as enthalpy. So it, it would be something of this nature, uh, ethanol, C2H5OH, uh, a liquid, undergoes combustion in the presence of oxygen, a gas obviously, to produce carbon dioxide, a gas, plus water. And we have what we call the heat of reaction, or combustion if you want to call it that, to be uh, exothermic, that's what the negative indicates, 1,235 kilojoules for that reaction. So one mole of methanol reacts with three moles of oxygen to produce two moles of carbon dioxide gas, three moles of water liquid, and liberates in the process 1,235 kilojoules. Now, for whatever reason, you might need to express this uh, heat of reaction in terms of uh, calories or kilocalories. What we'll do is make us a little problem here. Express uh, delta H of reaction in kilocalories. So if we take the uh, delta H of uh, the reaction to be a minus 1,235 kilojoules, then we can convert this to kilocalories uh, by dimensional analysis. Here's kilojoules to joules, and of course that's 1,000 joules per kilojoule, and so the kilojoules are canceled, and we now are in terms of joules, and then uh, joules to calories, and to do that we have 1.000 calorie is 4.184 joules. Now joules cancels out, and we're in terms of calories, and to get to kilocalories, we recall that it is a thousand calories for one kilocalorie and calories cancel out, and so our computations in terms are, has been converted to uh, kilocalories. Now, uh, we see that the uh, 10 to the thirds will cancel very nicely, and one times one, of course, is one times 1235, and this gives us uh, overall a negative, still exothermic reaction, but in terms of kilocalories, we'll have 1235, Five divided by 4.184 and the expression is now in terms of kilocalories. This computation comes out to 295.2 uh, uh, kcals 
four significant figures. 